This interview is with Dr. Thomas R. Russell. Good morning. Uh, the date is September 30th, 2012, and the interviewer is Jane Kennemore. Uh, Dr. Russell, where were you born and raised? Right, I've uh, lived my early years in San Francisco. I was born in San Francisco and went to grade school uh, in San Francisco, and then I went away to high school to a, a school called Thatcher down in Southern California. Huh. And then where did you go on to college? I went to Berkeley, UC uh, Berkeley, and then uh, gradu I, met, uh, I majored in zoology and graduated in 1962 and then went to a Jesuit medical school, uh, Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, and uh, I enjoyed my time there very much. Oh, good. And you, well, what attracted you to the practice of medicine, first of all? You know, I, I knew as a little boy I wanted to be a doctor. I, I don't know what it was, but I always uh, wanted to be a physician. I never really thought about it. It was always uh, kind of a direction that I wanted to assume. And, and I remember stating that when I was six or seven years old. And uh, I, I, I have no idea what made me think that, but I have no regrets, and, and it's been terrific. Uh, great, it was a great profession, and I am delighted that uh, one of my daughters is going to be a surgeon, too. Oh, interesting. And was anyone in your family a, a, a physician? No, mm -mm. not so at all. So you decided this all on your own? Yeah. I, yeah. You know, obviously, there were some influences, and I, I always liked uh, things. I remember uh, when I was in, in high school, uh, we had a public speaking class, and, and the thing was to, uh, you, you were, had to demonstrate something. You had to give a talk and demonstrate something. And I, um, I my demonstration was I dissected cats for the class and, and showed the, the class about anatomy and so on. So obviously, when I was 15 or so, I was very interested in, um, in, in anatomy. And I used to work in the summer on a ranch, uh, a guest ranch, and I was always pretty good around horses. So I, we did a lot of veterinarian things on the horses and so on. So I, I had these contacts when I was pretty young. I and uh, I remember one day I had a horse I was riding died. You, could you imagine riding a horse and having it die right underneath you? And I tried to perform an autopsy on the horse, and I, I didn't get very far. But I was so interested in what could have caused the death of that horse that I felt I needed to do an autopsy and, I mean, talk about being naive, I mean, it was crazy, sorry. So did you know from the beginning you were going to go into surgery? I always liked surgery, exactly, and I loved anatomy in medical school, and I thought anatomy was a direct conduit to becoming a surgeon. In reality, it's probably not that, that as direct anymore, uh -huh. but, um, but then when I got into medical school, um, I had some really good mentors that furthered my interest in surgery. Interesting. And you took a straight surgery internship? Or? No, I, I took, in those days, they were called a rotating internship. And I came back to San Francisco and, and was at the San Francisco General Hospital. And we spent a month on uh, different services. And, uh, and then uh, I was accepted into the uh, UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, uh, general surgical program which I was very thankful for. Did you feel you received some benefit from the rotating internship? I think so, yeah. I think it was good. We spent time on obstetrics and internal medicine, and I think it was a nice all-rounded uh, internship. Good. Um, according to your vita, you spent a year fellowship at the American Hospital in Paris, right. which must have been really interesting. Um, what did you learn from your year-long year experience in France, um, and how was the practice of medicine there different from the U.S., if it was? Yeah. Well, it, it was different. It uh, obviously has a system uh, where everybody has insurance in France, and the doctors work very differently. Um, when I was there, I don't think uh, many of the doctors particularly liked the system, but I think it was very good for the population. They they had coverage and so on. Mm -hmm. Why did I do that? Well, I, at that point I was, um, I'd spent two and a half years in the Navy, so I was a, a little bit uh, older, and this was a research year, and I didn't have any particular interest to go in and do a research lab, so I thought it would be interesting to go and visit a foreign country and see how their system worked. And I had met this French professor who had come 
to San Francisco to speak to the Department of Surgery, a wonderful man by the name of Maurice McCartier. And I asked him, I said, would you like to have, could I come over and spend a year with you and watch you? Uh, and he was a, a very well-known surgeon in France at that time, was head of the big public hospital, the PTA Salpetriere, he was chief of surgery, then also chief of surgery at the American Hospital outside of Paris in Neuilly. And I was his kind of associate for a year, more even closer than some of the French residents. I mean, he really took wonderful care of me. And it gave me a, a, a broader perspective of health care and how you could do things so differently in, in France than, for example, in the United States. Uh, one thing that I remember clearly is um, uh, a lot of the French surgeons turn over the care postoperatively to others like the anesthesiologists or other people on the healthcare team, and that was so different than in the United States. So I observed all these differences, and I think I became more open and understanding of different ways of practicing. In that respect, it was a worthwhile year. Did you bring anything home with you? Could you adapt uh, some of the French practices in the U.S. or not? Yeah, probably. I'd have to think about that, but I'm not not the not the technical aspect so much, but just the way of handling patients and so on. And some things I agreed with, and other things I didn't agree with. Uh, for example, they're not at least when I was there, which was in the 70s, mm -hmm. they they were no, nowhere near as open with patients and telling them what was wrong with them. And uh, I used to marvel at, at how little they, they, they told their patients, particularly if they had bad problems like uh, malignancy or something of that sort. They would send them off to, a, to, to another hospital that might be even called a cancer hospital, but they, they didn't have a lot of dialogue with the patient. And I questioned them on that. I said, why don't you speak more to your patients and get them to understand? And, and I remember one fellow said, well, the French uh, personnel just couldn't accept that. There, it would be too much of a, of a shock, and they, they wouldn't tolerate it. So. Uh, I found that interesting, but then there were some really good things about the French system, and everybody was covered. So um, I, I had a um, a good year. Uh, it was a good broad-based uh, year and understanding different systems. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Um, when did you become a fellow of the college? I became a fellow. I probably of nineteen. Um, 77, I would imagine, because you have to take your boards, you have to be board certified. And I took those and passed in 77, so I would have applied immediately thereafter. So it was 1977, I sh should have looked at my certificate, 77 or 78. Okay. And it, it, is this a long process that you go through to become a fellow? No, no, once you've completed all the prerequisites, okay. in other words, you've you know, finished, uh, obviously, medical school, you've finished your residency in good standing, and then you've taken the two parts of the boards in general surgery. One, the first was a written exam, and then the second was an oral exam. And once you've passed those, now you're board certified. Now you become eligible to become a member of the College of Surgeons. So you can apply, um, at least in my era, in that time frame, and then you would be interviewed. You'd have an interview and then uh, accepted. And, you know, I, uh, in, in my era, uh, it was pretty much everybody wanted to become a member of the College of Surgeons. And in my case, uh, I was now working with two other surgeons in San Francisco, one of whom had been the um, um, chairman of the Board of Governors and had had some very uh, important positions in the college. I think he was the second vice president and uh, he always was coming back from meetings and encouraged me to, to become involved. And so his name was Don Gallagher. So he was an influential person in getting me going into the college. He felt it had great value and stood for the right things and uh, that I should become active. Did you feel, how did you feel um, at your installation, for example? I mean, what was... Yeah, actually, you know, well, like tonight, they're having the, the, the ceremonies tonight. I, I was working that night, so I, I didn't come back for that. But, but I, I went every, I've come basically every year to the Clinical Congress. And uh, so even though I missed my installation because Dr. Gallagher had to go for some stuff, business things, I guess, I was simply a new initiate. And whether you go or not is, 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 is not, that is not uh, mandatory. So, but I've, I've made almost every meeting over the years. Uh, and initially it was for 
you know, activities related to the practice of surgery, postgraduate courses and things of this sort. And more recently, I, I select more of the things of general interest. Mm -hmm. What was the most satisfying part of being a surgeon? No question. The most satisfying thing is uh, the patient. And uh, uh, I've often thought about that. Not so much the technical aspects of doing surgery, because I had a, a busy practice in San Francisco. Uh, I did mostly intestinal surgery, mostly colon and rectal surgery. Um, but it was the, you know, meeting a patient today and getting them to understand that this was not going to be a, um, a negative, we're going to make this as positive an experience as we could. Uh, doing the surgery that you had to do technically and then helping them and their family through the post-operative course and then seeing them in the office uh, months later or even years later. So that was really rewarding to see, to be able to, to use the discipline of surgery to help people. And that's, what I, that's really what I enjoyed. The technical part, which is exciting when you're really young, learning how to do these things for the first time, um, I'm experiencing that through my daughter now who tells me all these wonderful operations. And I keep saying, well, how did the patient do, though? That's what I'm interested in. And uh, so I think that's what happens when you get a little more mature. You really look at the whole process and, and how you're helping a patient rather than the actual technical operation. So your daughter is still in the technical phase. She's in the technical phase, although she's getting better. <laughs> I keep I keep keep bothering her about that. Uh, and now she's telling me about these wonderful patients and that they, they want her to come out to visit them on their ranch or something like that. And so I'm thinking that she's, she's moving her way into that. Because a lot of, not everybody appreciates that. So there are some surgeons who are really just focused on the technical aspects. And they don't want to have um, a lot of time spent uh, with conversations and talking and all that, uh, which is a different way, of, different way of practicing, which you can do. I mean, I'm not being critical of that style either. But from my own personal aspect, I, I love the, the uh, personal relationships with patients makes it a lot easier for the patient. It makes it a lot easier for the patient. It makes it a little more, you know, I think, satisfying for you professionally, too. I don't know. That's sort of was my view. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was the most difficult um, part of being a surgeon in practice? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's very time-consuming. And um, so you have to be able to uh, balance these things with, with a, a big chunk of your time devoted you know, to, to the stuff in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So you got up pretty early in the morning and you had to make rounds, make sure the patients were okay. And, and then, um, and so what got shortchanged was uh, your family. Now, I didn't get married until I was 40, so the children came when I was pretty well along in my career. But um, I probably could have done more uh, on the personal side, but surgery is sort of a, like a jealous mistress. It, 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 you know, when you do it, you, when you do surgery, and if you're successful and if you're busy, and if you have problems and complications, you've got to be there. You can't just um, say, "Well, I've got to get home to my family." It's five o'clock. So uh, th that was that was definitely the hardest uh, part of it. I, I think juggling the uh, professional time and obligations with the personal time. I didn't do a very good job. My wife reminds me of that regularly. <laughs> when, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I probably am, but when you started in the practice of surgery, infections were yeah. major. Then still are. Still, and yeah, but then didn't it kind of go away a little bit with antibiotics, but now there's so many antibiotic resistant. Yeah, I think, you know, the best antibiotic is no antibiotic. And, and so, you know, loading people up with lots of antibiotics with anticipation that you're going to prevent an infection doesn't really always do the trick, I think. Um, but, um, you know, it's changed a lot. And, and antibiotics are a two-edged sword, so you, don't, you can't rely on them. You've got to do good surgery on the right patients at the right time, and hopefully uh, you won't get infections. And you have to follow basic surgical principles that we're all taught in these residencies. So... Oh, every surgeon has infections. They're, they're, they're difficult to deal with and can really be devastating. So you were in practice until 1999. Right. Um, what led to your second career at well, that, uh, ACS? That's a, that's a great question. I've often asked myself that question. I was, um, like I said, I was head of surgery at our hospital, a very good 
private hospital in San Francisco that used to actually be the old Stanford before they moved, Stanford University Hospital before they moved to Palo Alto in the late 50s. I had a really good job there. I was on the, the board of trustees and, um, and, and I had a, a, a really good practice. And I was a regent of the college. I'd become a, I was a governor and then I became a regent. And um, in 1999, in, in June, the Board of Regents meeting, uh, they decided that the current direct, director um, was just not the right person for the job at the time, and he was moved to another position with, on trials and um, trials research. And they, were, they put a search out for a new executive director. And I had missed that meeting, that Regents meeting, the only meeting I ever missed, because one of my daughters was graduating from high school that exact day. And uh, I was asked to give a little talk. And so I missed the meeting, but someone called me afterwards. Actually, it was Dr. George Sheldon to fill me in on the meeting and what had happened. And he said, you know, have you ever thought about uh, maybe become, running for the, be, being the uh, director? And it, it, they, at that point, they had changed the name from director to executive director. And I said, I said, no, I never would think about that. And, and he said, I, and I said, I'm not interested because I'm, you know, I'm in San Francisco. I've got a big practice. Uh, you know, uh, uh, healthy practice, and uh, I've got these obligations. And then a few days went by, and I guess I kept reflecting back on that phone call. Why did he ask me about this? And then it was amazing. Over a few days, my mind changed, and I said, you know, it would be terrific, to perhaps, to have a second career, and to do that. So I called George up, and he said, well, you, you better get going because we're having these interviews next week. And so I went back for the interview and. Uh, they, they had some really good people, and for whatever reason they, they chose, uh, I got called the next day, uh, and I thought he was just going to thank me for coming, and I, he said, you have the job. And so, I th or he said, I have a couple more little hoops you have to go through, but, but we the committee has selected you, and that has to be approved by the Board of Regents. So that was uh, quite a day for me. I'll never forget that. I'll bet it was. Yeah. So when you came in, you made some major changes in the organization. How? Uh, what did you see that needed changing, and what right. did you do? Well, you know, first of all, morale was kind of low. It was low because uh, there there had been some change, and Dr. Narwald had been interim, and he had done a, a stellar job getting things more or less back in order. But a lot of the staff were uncertain about the college and their future. So, first thing I needed to do was to um, you know, get some stability with respect to the workforce, because you know, when you when you're the the head of something like the College of Surgeons, all the work gets done by a really good workforce, but they have to like what they're doing. I mean, they have to be in a good state of mind and they have to be positive about things. So that took a little while. And then and during that period of time and getting to know people and going around the college and meeting everybody and going to their, their, their little desks and talking to what they do and so on and their family, whatever I, whatever I could do to cement their relationships, I, I then got a feel for the things that needed to change in the college. and. Uh, there were some really good people that had been around for a long time that, um, you, you know, just weren't kind of with the changes that were going to in inevitably happen in healthcare. Just like now, I mean, this is a very dynamic time in healthcare, and and I felt that we needed to bring in, for example, somebody in education who was cutting edge on on the uh, in education, and um, so so I started um, making some changes in the college. We we also decreased uh, the number of. Um, Departments. I think there were 15 departments or something like that, and everybody was sort of equal, and everybody was fighting for, for turf in their little department, and we just went down to four divisions, four major divisions, uh, you know, one of research and one in education, one of member services, and then, you know, we, we had another one on the Washington office. Mm -hmm. So, and then we changed, we, we needed to change some personnel, which was difficult because some people had been around for a long time and thought they they'd be around a lot even longer and that was a little difficult the concept of getting some people off the bus that had done a really good job but their time was over and that was not easy that was difficult but finally we got the team in place and with a lot of encouragement and being uh, open to change which is really important and and also understanding um, now immersed in healthcare and healthcare reform and where things were going I kind of knew what we needed to do and um, we, we eventually started making some changes. So I think those are some of the early things that I attempted to do and really uh, understand uh, what was likely to happen and begin to try to work with other groups, uh, not be, be isolated, but to be able to work in a more collegial fashion with lots of other groups. So we, we cemented our relationship with the American Medical Association. At one point, we pulled out of the AMA. 
there had been a, um, a, a new society that was formed called the American Society of General Surgeons, and they had formed because uh, of, 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 um, of, uh, of disagreement with, with the college on some issues. Remember, most of our members are general surgeons, so we didn't want to have another group forming that were of society. So I went over and I went to their meetings, and they even made me an honorary member, and, and then we brought them in and gave them a governor. So now they're, they're not an entity, but, but that was something that I, I think was worthwhile doing. And I tried to reach out to all the other surgical specialties uh, to get them to know what we were trying to do so that they didn't need to do this or that. But unfortunately, um, you can only go so far because everybody wants to have their own identity. But I think we made some progress. Excuse me, Mr. Ron I think, but I think we made some progress in those, in those, uh, those issues. And um, I, I would say those are, would be um, some of my things that I, that I would like to think we're worthwhile. Huh. Good. According to your annual report for 2009, one of the major issues facing the college is compensation, um, particularly with regard to Medicare reimbursement. Um, what's the disadvantage of using the current standard of sustainable growth rate to figure Medicare? reimbursement and what is the alternative that might work and and what are your personal feelings about this yeah um, well um, it's a, it's a very difficult issue and right now as as, as we we sit here um, you know we're um, looking at a presidential election in I think 37 days and uh, there's differences uh, between the candidates, but the facts remain, whether you're, however you look at this thing, that we've got to do something about the cost of health care. And I think any of us who have been in health care um, realize there's a lot of waste. Um, and, um, you know, I'm a patient now, too. So I was a provider for many years, now I'm a patient. And I can, I see what's done in the bills. I mean, it is remarkable. And so, um, I, I think we're, we're slowly and, and gradually be, beginning to accept the fact that something has to be done with the estimated one-third waste of health care dollars. And the, the two point whatever it is, trillion dollars are spent in health care, about a third of it is thought to be wasted and no value for the patient. And um, so, uh, and a lot of that is generated by hospitals wanting to do more. And, you know, the more you do, the more you, the more, the more you, you can generate as far as income goes. And doctors have the same incentives, too. I mean, they're on a fee, most doctors are on a fee-for-service schedule. Mm -hmm. So that the more you do, the more volume you create, the more, uh, the more money the institution can make, and, and also personally. And I think that's really um, uh, under siege right now. And uh, we're going to have to change. I mean, something has to be done uh, with the, the business of medicine. And so... Um, the SGR, you asked me specifically about the sustainable growth rate, um, has been a, the concept has been around for a while. It's not been really followed because every year the Congress um, puts a little amendment at the end and, and does away with the cuts that were supposed to be. But if they if they put in place all the SGR cuts that that, that have not been that have not happened for the last decade and a half, um, they have to come with with three three hundred billion dollars is the amount of money. So you could imagine what that would do to reimbursement for hospitals. They have to come up with $300 billion, and they would get that from, from the doctors and from the hospitals and so on because they haven't been following the, the formula all these years. They always have a last-minute fix. So um, we, we've got to come up with a better thing than the SGR, the Sustainable Growth Rate. The college is pushing uh, a concept of what they call value ba a value-based update or a value-based proposal, which basically ties uh, reimbursement to uh, quality and to value and to its cost, which seems to make a lot of sense to me. So um, that's one of the positions that the college is taking. But this has been a very thorny issue, and the SGR um, is, I think, um, broken and probably not, not a sustainable sort of a formula because they've, they've just not followed it. They've, just let get, they've gotten deeper and deeper and deeper in debt. And to get back to where, the, where they need to be, it would be uh, draconian, the cuts they'd have to make. So the college has come up with this value-based concept, which I think makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And how does, how does that differ? Yeah. 
Well, I, th I think a lot of what, what with the SGR is, it's, uh, it's, you're paid a lot on, on the volume of what you do. It's somewhat volume based. Whereas it, uh, we're going to change va of, of value for volume. So we're, we're looking at, at good, valuable things that can be done and pay for that where there's meaningful differences in a patient's well-being as opposed to paying just because you did X number of these things or a lot of volume. Um, and, and it'll have to all be worked out. Uh, they'll have to. You'll have to have good, you know, a good yardstick or parameters. Of what What are you looking for? What is What is value? Mm -hmm. And remember that that one of the shifts we're going to undoubtedly see in the United States in the next uh, few years is to move away from health care to health. In other words, in other words, keep people healthy, mm -hmm. and then you won't have to care for them a lot. And uh, that's going to be, you know, that's that's a pipe dream. I mean, it's 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 wishful. Um, but we've got we've got to do that because if you don't, we have such technology today. We have so many um, things that we can do that if if we have a really uh, infirmed public that are just needing a lot of health care, it really it really is devastating to the economy. Unless you want to spend, I mean, the, we're spending now 20 percent of the gross domestic product or close to 20 percent on health care. If you want it to go to 25 percent, 30 percent, 35 percent, then we, we shouldn't be worrying about these things. But my understanding, not being a medical economist, is that that's not good for, you know, the the overall well-being of a country. You, you've got to be able to contain healthcare at some level. And remember, we're way ahead of most other countries, yeah. at uh, 18, 19, 20 percent. And so uh, this is why everybody is going to be looking at ways to to remove the waste in the system. When you um, walk the streets of Chicago compared with San Francisco, do you notice a difference in obesity yeah. levels? There's some pretty uh, heavy folks in both those areas, but particularly here in Chicago, it's really quite something. Of course, you don't know where they're from. They may be from California <laughs> visiting. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge, this obesity thing is huge. and. Right now, of course, we're operating on a lot of these people, trying to get them to lose weight with surgery, which I think is an interesting concept. I've never, um, uh, but I think there, there there need to be other ways of doing it. And uh, uh, but right now, there's you know people are not listening to you know right. how to how to exercise and eat properly, and so surgery is one of the few things that kind of works. <laughs> I guess. Um. What do you think about the Affordable, Affordable Health Care Act in general? Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about that? I'll just speak for myself on that one. I, I think it's a step in the right direction. There are, I mean, it's 2,500 pages in length. There's lots of provisions in there. Uh, I was involved with a few, few meetings around the time that they were, these very smart people were working on coming up with all these proposals. Um, but I, I personally think that something has to be done, and the, the Democrats and the Republicans should get together and figure out, um, you know, what makes sense. But they're so polarized at this point, and this is sort of a flashpoint for the election, that there'll, there'll be probably none of that done for a while. But I think there's some really good things in ACCA, as it often goes under the name of this Patient Protection, uh, pa Patient Protection of Affordable Care Act, or ACCA. I think there's some really good things in there, um, like. Uh, you know, the dependents can stay on your plan until they're 26, and about pre-existing conditions are, are not, you're not excluded, um, uh, ban on lifetime limits, and there's a number of, of really good things in, in that, which I think the college embraces and which, which I would embrace. Mm -hmm. uh, more about evidence-based medicine, in other words, you want to try to standardize the practice of medicine so that everybody sort of approaches things in a similar way. I think there's much in, in there about the practice. And, but then they, they leave out some things that, that probably need to be shored up some. For example, um, some people object to what's called the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Uh, there's a, a, that ACCA calls for a, a, a board to be made up of, I think, about 15 people that will set p prices and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have that much of an objection to that if it's done right. Because someone's got to make the rules. You can't just have a free-flowing, you know, concept out there. And um, there's there's not substantive uh, issues in there about uh, liability reform, which is a big thing for surgeons. Uh, most surgeons get sued sometime in their career, and it's a devastating number one, and it, it changes your outlook somewhat. So 
I think um, if, if we go to having a more standardized way of practicing, so no matter where you, you get treated, whether it be in a small hospital in a rural area of the country or a big city hospital, the care is going to be as, as standardized as we can make it. Mm -hmm. And I think and if the doctors follow the standards um, and they have a bad outcome, which you know sometimes you have, mm -hmm. Um, they have a bad outcome that does not equal a lawsuit. And so there would be protection if we follow these standards. And I, I think that's probably what's going to happen. But ACA does not have much in the way of liability reform. So there's some, some uh, loopholes there, but there's some very positive things, I think, in, in that legislation. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to see what happens. It's yeah. ready to go in place in another, in another year or so, at least some, some major parts of it. Mm -hmm. um. The college was highly involved in research during your tenure as executive director. What were some of the major accomplishments during the first decade of the 21st century? Yeah, well, w uh, one thing we did was we, we, we set up a division of basically um, research. Oh, so that hadn't been a division N before? No, it hadn't. Uh, it, it was sort of lumped into education or uh, mm -hmm. things like that. But we actually formed a, a uh, division of research and optimal patient care mm -hmm. with the concept that things were going to become more, um, y y you know, organized in a, in, a more, uh, in, in a more direct way so that standards and, and guidelines and so on would be established. And we were able to recruit a young um, health services researcher, a surgeon, uh, who was at UCLA by the name of Clifford Coe. Uh, initially, Dr. Scott Jones helped me who was a retired um, surgeon, wonderful uh, individual and very thoughtful, and he was very interested in this, and he did a, uh, a wonderful job getting this started. But, um, but then after he decided to retire, we recruited Dr. Coe from UCLA, and he came, and, and we've now uh, really gotten going. Uh, we've, we've, we've established such programs as the National Surgical Quality Improvement Plan, or program which is, sets up uh, standards in hospitals where we assess outcomes in surgery, and there are a lot of hospitals across, across the United States that have adopted that for their uh, quality improvement in surgery. We've increased our scholars. We have some in-house scholars that do things. So I think we did a lot along the line of research, mostly establishing this, this division and recruiting people that really knew a lot about yeah. it. And establishing standards. And establishing standards yeah. and so on. That's and we, we, we actually, it was, it was early on, it was about 2000, the, the man that had um, established this quality assessment program that we call NISQIP, uh, Dr. Shukri Curry, uh, had established it for the VA. He was in Roxbury, um, Massachusetts, I believe, the Roxbury VA. And the, the Veterans Administration had been under siege by some of these legislators in Washington that their uh, qual their outcomes were not good. They were getting complaints from families or patients. And so the legislature were getting ready to do something at the VA, maybe even close it down because of poor standards. Dr. Shukri Curry, at least as far as surgery goes, established this program. And he came to the college in 2000, and we had long talks and many meetings. And he um, was very um, adamant and very uh, generous. And basically, he said, take this program and take it out into the in, into the, um, the general population. It's been successful in the VA because the VA now has really good results. And part of it was this NISQIP program. And so that's what we did. We started that about 2002 and it continued to evolve and, and flourish and really happy that we did that. So was this aimed more toward community hospitals then? Or? It, yeah, it's in community hospitals, university hospitals. Every, every yeah. place, okay. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how many hospitals now, but it's uh, it's one of the few programs, it is costly, but it's one of the few programs where you can as, uh, 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 assess the quality of your surgical, pro, uh, mm -hmm. surgical delivery system. It tracks infections, it tracks returns to surgery, it tracks uh, length of stay, uh, um, you know, and, and, and other key parameters. Uh, and is this information made available to patients or potential patients? It, it could be, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether it has or not depends somewhat on the institution. But yeah, a lot of hospitals use it as a way of, um, mm -hmm. you know, informing their patients. Yeah, interesting. Um, were there any other accomplishments that you're particularly proud of uh, during your tenure? Um, you know, thank you for that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, you know, I was a, uh, a just a pra I was a practicing surgeon, so I, mm -hmm. I 
and, and, and I had a position at the hospital where I had to deal with a lot, a lot of different types of surgeons. Uh, and um, so I think what I um, think was valuable was I, I did a lot of traveling to chapters and I met a lot of surgeons. And I would listen, do a lot of listening, and, and um, uh, try to resolve some of their problems. And so I, I think uh, reaching out to the membership was probably something that I enjoyed and I think maybe was, was effective because that had not been done a lot in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, the college had been a uh, kind of a revered institution and, um, and, and I, I don't think it reached out as much as it maybe could have. And so I, I think maybe I picked up that ball and ran with it. And I went to a lot of chapters, uh, went to a lot of meetings, um, and met many surgeons, listened to many complaints, uh, much of which is around reimbursement. And we did our best to uh, take that back, and we would do our best to try to resolve some of these issues. So I'm very proud of that. Um, also very proud of the fact that, that we, we really um, reached out more and more to young people and tried to make this the American College for Young Surgeons. And so we, start, we started some new groups like the Resident Associates Society. We had a little group for the medical students that were interested in surgery, trying to attract people when they were young to go into surgery and also have some uh, knowledge of what the college could offer them as far as programs were concerned. Um, so I, and, and then the other thing that, that, I, that I mentioned earlier that I was pleased that we were able to do is to reach out to other um, medical uh, professional associations. Uh, in other words, we were not going to be a standalone. We needed to do this in a much more collective and collaborative way with other groups. So we reestablished ourselves with the AMA, and I used to go to the AA, AMA meetings, as uh, difficult as that was sometimes. And then I would, um, w with all the surgical specialties, we tried to bring them together, and we had a little a group, a coalition of all the surgical specialties getting together and trying to work out some of these problems. The difficulty with that was that everybody has their own view on the way things should be. Right. And uh, for example, you asked me earlier about reimbursement in the SGR. Not all the surgical groups believe that there should be this value-based update or value-based program that they, they want to go a different route. Mm -hmm. So there would be uh, issues that would separate us. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do firmly believe, even today, uh, that as we go through change, we have to start coming together as the house of surgery or the house of medicine if we're going to be you know, having a meaningful say in healthcare reform. And despite the fact that um, I was the well, I was the archivist at the AMA for a time back in the '90s, and um, I know that their membership was falling. Yes. And I don't know if it's continued to fall or not. But did the ACS have a similar problem? Um, not as bad as the as the AMA, but the AMA. You're absolutely right. Their membership has fallen to something like uh, 15 to 18 percent of mm -hmm. of all physicians in the United States. Uh, that's that's the percent they're members of the AMA. 15 mm -hmm. to 18 percent. Uh, we have had the college has had some trouble with some of the surgical uh, the specialties within surgery, like for example, orthopedic surgeons uh, find much more value joining the, the, their society, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And um, likewise, um, other groups uh, will, will only have a penetration of maybe 20, 30 percent of certain specialties. Now, in general surgery, it's very good. Mm -hmm. Pediatric surgery, it's very good. So it's it's a little bit of hit or miss. But I think we're doing um, we're able we're doing better than than some of the other groups because uh, a lot of young people today don't see value in these professional associations. Yeah. Uh, they say, "What is what's in this for me? You're asking me to pay dues, and uh, I just want to go out and, and and do my job and and make a decent living." and and what do you have to offer? So this is a challenge for the college in the future, is to be able to offer value. Just like we're going to have to do value with respect to health care and delivering health care, um, the, the college has to deliver value if they're going to, we're going to expect young people to join. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in my era, it was different. It was an honor to become a member of the college. It was just sort of a, the next step in your progression through school, if you will. Yeah. But uh, not anymore. We have to really show that we're making a difference. And that's true, I think, across all professional I think organizations. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you're, you're chairman of the board of the ACS Foundation. Um, yeah. How does that organization benefit the ACS and the practice of surgery in general? And what have been some major projects or? Yeah. Or well, uh, 
for quite a few years, I guess probably beginning in the 90s, uh, we, we had a little department. Once again, we had all these departments. We had a department of, of uh, development. And the idea was to get philanthropic dollars to help with um, what I always call white hat issues, uh, education, research, scholarships, things like that, that nobody would really have any controversy over. It wasn't like the SGR or the, some of the political issues. And so um, that was very, was successful. And I thought it would be really important to, to even take it a step further. So when I was the executive director in about 2005, I got to know somebody uh, who, at a seminar who, who did this. And I brought him in to get some ideas from him. And we just established the, the foundation as the, as the sort of the, 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 uh, the next step following the development, uh, the, the, the department, the, the division of development. And um, we've organized it. We, we initially had one person, and now we have a staff of five. And they, ha they some handle corporations and, uh, you know, um, companies that, that can give money, and, and others work on individual giving. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's been very successful because the money there that we generate goes for uh, issues that the college really stands for, which is basically improving the care of the surgical patient through education and so on. So I, I think that was a, a very um, use, useful thing. Uh, that last year we raised uh, $3 million. And, uh, and then we, we have a lot of money that we've raised in the past we haven't spent. And that's spinning off, obviously, interest. So you know we've, we've raised more than three, maybe $5 million. And if you add up all the assets that we have contributed. And now what we have to do is, is figure out good ways to use that money. So for example, uh, a wonderful surgeon that was a friend of mine or knew him in at our hospital in San Francisco, a very successful surgeon, uh, gave, uh, he was from Syria, of all places, he trained in the United States, very successful practice, gave a very nice gift to the college for international scholars. And I remember asking him, does this scholar have to be from Syria? <laughs> I'm sure there'd be someone right now would like to get out of Syria and come over for this scholarship. He said, no, no, no from anywhere. It doesn't have to be from Syria. So um, he, uh, uh, he was very generous. And we've got several wonderful benefactors for the college that have given over a million dollars. And uh, I think we've done much better than the AMA, for example. Um, and um, and, and, and likewise, each year we get one uh, 1,500 to 1,800 people give money. We could do better, but we're still working on that. And the concept, concept is this is your college. Um, you, you've enjoyed your profession. It's time now to give back to your profession because most surgeons have been successful, and, and, and it's fine to give to the Red Cross and so on, but why not give something to your profession? And there's a whole list of things on the menu that you perhaps would be interested in. If you're a trauma surgeon, or if you're a cancer surgeon, or if you're an international surgeon, or if you're interested in, in uh, education or whatever, you can find a niche within the college to donate some money and it will be designated just for that purpose. So I, I think it's going to be appealing. I think the foundation will become progressively important as the years go by. Oh, that's great. Um, with this meeting, the ACS will begin the celebration of its centennial. Um, what are some of the major contributions the college has made since its founding in 1913? Well, I think, um, I, I think it's, it, it's helped to set standards. Um, it, it's, um, it always stood for quality and patient care and so on. And I think if you, as you look back on the, on the history of the college, that was, would be really what you'd, you'd focus on. I mean, the, the clinical congress and the meeting uh, that they had in the early days was, you know, about all they had. I mean, there was no internet, obviously, and there was no way you could get it in any other way. So the surgeons used to come from all over the country, probably by train, to Chicago for this, what they called the congress. And uh, that, was, that was fine. And, that, and now that's just, continue to evolve and change with all sorts of programs and and um, we do them some some of them locally or regionally around the country and um, lots of stuff on tapes or on the inter internet there's lots of things that we're doing educationally uh, one of the other early things that the college did uh, was to establish standards for hospitals and uh, that um, that was a very important uh, concept which led to um, 
you know, the, the Joint Commission and, and taking over the standardization of hospitals. Because in the, in the early days, 1913, you could open up a hospital or you could do whatever you wanted. There were no standards. There was no you know, rules or regulations. It's just if you were an entrepreneur and wanted to get into the hospital business, you could open up a clinic on the next corner and, and be in business. And so the college really established uh, standards of care and what should be done, what, what a hospital should have. They needed to have a pathology department, record keeping, all this and that. And uh, it became very cumbersome for the college to run that. So in the 50s, I think it was 1954, it, 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 it turned that over to what was then called the, the Joint, Joint Commission for Accreditation of Hospitals. And then that's now just called the Joint Commission. So that was a very uh, early thing that was started by surgeons and, uh, and was promoted until it just got to become cumbersome and it was very expensive to run. So I think the college is you know, really proud of that. I think reaching out uh, to internationally is very important that we've tried to improve health care in other parts of the world. Um, I think Operation Giving Back, which we, we started in, during my 10 years, is very useful in helping uh, uh, getting surgeons to go off to different areas to help in Haiti or wherever they might want to go. So those are all some of the things that immediately come to mind. And, and aside from the Affordable Health Care Act, which obviously is facing the college right now. Uh, what are some other major issues? What do you expect the college to accomplish in the next 10, 15, 20 years? Yeah. Well, um, the, the college has to be able to evolve as, um, as a professional organization. You know, we're not a trade association. Uh, Paul Ryan, you know, the vice presidential candidate, gave a talk in Washington to the college membership and he said, nice to speak in front of this trade association. And I stopped him and I said, we're not a trade association, we're a professional association. And I think that we have to always keep that in mind as we go forward about what we want to do what's best for the patient. This is about patient care, not about economics or money or whatever. And so uh, money's important, but we, we have to realize that we're in this, in this for you know, good patient care. So as things evolve, uh, the college is going to have to change uh, and be aware of, of, of these changes so that we can help fellows stay abreast and, and offer programs that will be of value to them in their practice. And, and things will be very different. For example, um, most doctors in the, in the, probably today and certainly in the past were in solo practice or were in, in practices and maybe a few were together. Um, now more and more are coming together, and now more and more are going to be working for hospital systems. And it's been estimated that the majority of, of doctors and surgeons will, will be employees in the future. Now, whether that happens or not, I'm not certain. But those are the kind of things that could happen that would have a profound effect on the college. So it, it, has, to be, it has to be nimble. It has to be able to respond to the outside world the way healthcare is going. And so... Um, I would hope that the leadership in the future will have an open mind to change um, and, and not be one of these organizations that I'm all in favor of change unless it affects me and, 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 and hunker down to the, the old way of doing things because there's a tendency for that to happen uh, with, um, with member, m member with a membership organization where some of the members who are quite vocal don't see the need for, for changes right now. And so um, I get back to, the, to, to a little talk I gave, um, that was then and this is now. And so we have to be open to these changes and I think if we do that, the college will continue to evolve and continue to be a viable and pertinent in institution uh, a, a, in the future. Oh, thank you. Do you have anything to add that um, you'd like to finish with? <laughs> talk about or anything? Well, it's... Um, um, you know, I think medicine is a, is a wonderful profession. I'd certainly do it again. Um, and um, I'm not one of these doctors who um, says I'd never advise anybody to go into medicine. Um, but um, it's, it's going to be different. And um, I think that if you, if you go into it with the right idea that you're into it for, you know, patients, and you like, you like to do that, then it'll always be a, a, very, rewarding, a very rewarding profession. And I think that um, the future uh, physicians need to be open that it, the systems are going to change and that they may be working for a group as opposed to private practice. But that's fine. I mean, the patients will still be there. That, that's the common thread. So um, 
I, I have no regrets, and I enjoyed very much my time at the college. The ten years that I spent, I learned a lot um, about healthcare, and, and I met a lot of people that were not just surgeons. My, my world before I took this job was, was really uh, surgery centric. It was mostly surgical rounds and surgical patients, and I dealt with the surgeons mostly. This job that I, that I attempted to do for 10 years at the college exposed me to lots of different people and um, uh, other, other disciplines within medicine, but more importantly, to other people who were not physicians who were in the health business. In other words, these, these were health services researchers or people that were in, the, in, in health research. And I, I learned a lot from them, and uh, it made me much, uh, I think, uh, better understand the complexities of healthcare and how if you come at it with a very narrow mind at what's, what's best for me, uh, Tom, and what's best for surgery, you're, you're missing the, the, the big picture. You've, you've got to incorporate that into a much broader perspective. So I think that was something that I really got out of the job and I, I enjoyed that. And I still um, try to keep, keep track of what's going on in, uh, in healthcare. Uh, there's a lot of research being done now. There's like just this month came out an issue in health affairs of all these very thoughtful articles about what's being done and various pilots that are being done around the country trying to figure out how to get around some of these quality issues and some of the waste issues and some of the cost issues. So I, I'm still sort of interested in this, but uh, I'm, I'm not obviously in the front lines anymore. Yeah. If I Thank ever, you. If I ever was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so. you so no, much. No, it was very nice talking with you. Yeah. I enjoyed it. It was great fun. We went for about an hour, I think.